This is the Citizen of Heaven podcast. I am Hal Hammonds, and I am a Citizen of Heaven, and I am your embedded correspondent in Satan's world. I bring you this message of hope today from Pensacola, Florida. This is report number 13, dated July 2nd, in the year of our Lord, 2019. I breathe God's grace and peace to all my fellow sojourners here in this earthly plane. I remain sound in body, alert in mind, and energized in spirit. I'm pleased to bring you this report of my recent labors in the Lord. Here's a synopsis. I've been preaching about intoxication. Proverbs 23 describes two kinds of drunkenness, literal and figurative, and they both start before the first sip. I've been reading Jonathan Edwards by Ian e. H. Murphy. I'm no Calvinist, but I dare say Edwards could have taught some of my brethren some things about the sovereignty of God. I've been hearing religious dissidents in Chinese prisons are being executed and their organs harvested. Give it to the communists, they're all about efficiency. I've been playing Euphoria, building a better dystopia. Keeping your people happy and ignorant may seem like a good plan for spiritual leadership today, but Jesus has a better one. Are you ready? Here we go. This is what I've been preaching. I'd like you to play along with me a little bit with an exercise in Proverbs 23. If you're watching the video, I'll put the relevant verses on the screen, uh, starting in verse number 26. You may recognize the context, but don't get ahead of me on this. Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit, and an adulterous woman is a narrow well. Surely she lurks as a robber, and increases the faithless among men. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? That takes us through verse 29, which may be the verse that you're used to beginning with instead of ending with when you read from this context, especially if you uh, do a lot of studying about alcohol and drunkenness and social drinking, that sort of thing. This is my go-to text, starting verse 29, with regard to social drinking and why you shouldn't take the first drink. But look at it in the context. If you were only reading the verses that we just read, wouldn't you naturally assume that verse 29 was talking about the woman? Woes, sorrows, contentions, complainings, wounds without cause, redness of eyes. That's what happens to men after they chase after the wrong woman. Well, am I saying that it's not talking about alcohol? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there is perhaps a hidden meaning here. Solomon is all about the riddles. He talks a lot about riddles in the book of Proverbs. And sometimes these Proverbs have layered meanings. And I think this is one of those. The problems that we get into with alcohol are very similar, in fact, to the problems that we get into with women or with men, if you're talking about a female protagonist here. We give ourselves over to something that is inherently dangerous, but that we think we can manage. And so we go a little bit down the wrong road, and before too long, we're going a little bit farther and a little bit farther. And before we know it, we have given ourselves over to this hedonistic lifestyle that is going to destroy our souls. And it all began not with the first sip, but before the first sip, when we looked at the wine when it was red in the glass, when we valued something that God did not want us to value. Does God want us to enjoy ourselves? Absolutely. Does God value the male-female relationship? Absolutely. Our culture is founded upon that. Go back to the Garden of Eden. There's nothing wrong with men and women. But what is wrong is when we pursue a carnal relationship or a, an entertainment relationship, if you want to talk about alcohol, outside of the boundaries that God has laid out. When we give ourselves over to a pathway that will logically lead in the wrong direction, we set ourselves up for disaster. And we content ourselves oftentimes by thinking, yes, I am going down the wrong road, but I will not go very far. That's the conversation that we usually have about alcohol. We talk about, well, well, sure, drunkenness is bad. The Bible continually uh, condemns drunkenness, but I'm not going to get drunk. At least in theory, I'm not going to get drunk. I'll just take a little bit. I'll just have one glass of beer or maybe a couple of glasses of wine in an evening. Uh, I won't get intoxicated, at least not legally intoxicated. It's kind of funny that we allow the law to decide what's a sin and what's not a sin instead of listening to God. That didn't make a lot of sense, but that being the case anyway. 
is it really such a great idea for us to content ourselves with a little bit of a bad thing by telling us we're not going to wind up taking any more after our allotment is done, assuming, of course, we can make that decision in an intoxicated or partially intoxicated state. It works the same way with women. Or, again, men, if, if you are a lady and you're drawn toward, toward the men. Uh, women insist on equal opportunity to ogle ant eye candy these days, apparently. At any rate, is it appropriate for us to look at naked people in a magazine or on the internet or in the movies or whatever? Are you going to go to hell because you see a naked body? Well, that's not the conversation we need to be having. Just the same way that we're not supposed to be having a conversation about whether one glass of wine is going to send you to hell or one glass of beer. That's not the main issue. The issue is what do you value in your life? Do you value noble things or you do, do you value ignoble things? Are you pushing back uh, against God's requirements of you? Do you hear the, the siren call of your friends out there in the world that Peter talks about, 1 Peter 4, verses, verse 3, that they malign you because they're not, you're not giving over the same excess of dissipation? They want as much of this bad stuff as possible, and you're not that way. Do you resent that a little bit? Are you interested in going to the bar with them and maybe drinking a little bit? Is that how much you value that company? And the same way with, with sex. Is it appropriate for us to be chasing after sinful impulses, thinking that we're not going to go all that far? Isn't it better all the way around for us to choose the right path instead of choosing to go a little bit down the wrong path? Before too long, we wind up becoming intoxicated. And even if we don't, even if we do not get to the reasonable conclusion of this path that we've chosen for ourselves, we've still chosen a path that is contrary to God's wishes for our lives. Isn't it better for us to think on the noble things, the good things, the things of good repute as God defines them? Philippians 4 verse 8 gives us a whole list of things that we're supposed to be thinking about. Jesus Christ most of all, of course, setting our mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. When our value system prioritizes good things, spiritual things, noble things instead of fleshly carnal things, then more often than not, far more often than not, we find out that these day-to-day -day situational circumstances that come up, the questions settle themselves. It's not a matter of whether one drink or whether one click or whether one movie, whatever, is going to doom us to hell. It's about how am I going to glorify Jesus Christ the best I can in this life? That's the path I'm going to choose. That's the path I'm going to stick with. I'm not rethinking that. I don't want the other path. I want the path that Jesus is giving me. Anyway, that's what I've been preaching. This is what I've been reading. I am not a Calvinist, and I probably ought to get that squared away right off the bat because I'm going to say some very positive things about Jonathan Edwards. The uh, biography that I've been reading uh, of his life, uh, written by N. Murphy, paints a, a very positive picture of a man who is disparaged in even religious circles and certainly secular circles in the modern day. Uh, his place in American history is is denigrated and marginalized. There's no question, though, looking back on three, four hundred years of American history, that the Great Awakening in the early 18th century changed the face of America. And Jonathan Edwards is, was absolutely at the forefront of the Great Awakening. I, he is a Calvinist. He, he was a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist. And, and I'm not, as I mentioned before. I do not believe in certain aspects of John Calvin's teaching. But as I read Jonathan Edwards and what he stood for and how he read the Bible and the preaching that he uh, gave to America in his day, I see a lot of not only truth, not only Bible truth, but also truth that is extraordinarily relevant in the modern day that we need to be preaching today. Uh, in fact, I was moved to go back and read uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I had read uh, uh, portions of that back in school, back when you were allowed to acknowledge God in schools. And I think I may comment on that next week. I don't want to get into that today, the specifics of that particular sermon. 
But uh, as far as Edwards goes in his philosophy, I'd like to give you basic, th- you know, three basic tenets of his preaching, as far as I can tell from reading about him and about his work, uh, that are absolutely true, that were absolutely at the core of his preaching and that need to be at our at the core of our preaching today, at my preaching today. The first one is that mankind apart from God is lost. Uh, That is something that is highly debated, of course, in the modern day, the idea of of people being depraved and and exactly how that happened. Uh, I don't want to get into a whole Adamic sin kind of discussion, but there's, if you read the Bible, if you believe what the Bible says, there's no question that humanity, apart from the grace of God, has no hope. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. There's a lot of very high concept philosophy and theology included in those two small verses. But what it essentially boils down to is this, that we had messed up our lives. And notice here that Paul talks about his own sins. We had sinned. Our trespasses and sins. We mess things up for ourselves, and we were dead as a result of that. There's nothing that the dead people have to say about being dead. That's why we need grace. God is going to come in, in the, by giving his, his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. We can become alive, not because we deserved it, because we had earned it, but because God loved us and because God was willing to make this tremendous sacrifice on our behalf. All that we can do in our lost state is to reach out for grace and and hope and pray that we're able to come in contact with it. And thankfully, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Point number two is the idea of the awakening. And again, I want to emphasize this. 17th century America was extremely religious. Virtually everybody went to church services. Uh, virtually everybody was a part that the church was the center of of culture, of urban culture, so, uh, it wasn't suburban culture back then, but even rural culture. Everybody knew who the preacher was. Everybody was involved in the local church. The work of the preacher was central in the local society. And in that society, in that highly religious society, Jonathan Edwards went into his congregation week after week and told them how sinful they were, how they had not truly given themselves over to Jesus. And they accepted that. At least many of them did. They were blown away by this idea that you could be a religious person and not know Jesus Christ, that you could be a religious church going kind of person and not truly have Jesus in your heart. There is a fundamental difference between religious people and godly people, between religious people and Christians, as the Bible describes Christians being. Edwards was not satisfied. We should not be satisfied with simply being partakers in religious things. We need to be given over to Jesus Christ in the fullest and most complete sense of the word. And as far as Calvinism goes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Murphy makes this point also in his book, and, and Jonathan Edwards refers to Romans chapter 5 and, and other passages that talk about the, the foreknowledge of God and, and his willingness to to save certain people and not save certain people. We need to emphasize this. And we don't want to sound like Calvinists when we say this, but this is undeniably true. God's plan does not have to make sense to us for it to be valid. There are a lot of things about Calvinism that I reject that make no sense at all to me, but I want to be on the record with with this. I don't reject Calvinism because it doesn't make sense. I reject Calvinism, Calvinism because the Bible doesn't teach it. The Bible rejects the idea of being born depraved. The Bible doesn't talk about that. The Bible talks about being born innocent. We, the same argument uh, can be used for baptism and should be used for baptism. There are a lot of people out there who don't understand why you have to be baptized. And my argument against that, my ultimate go-to argument is, I don't care. I'm not trying to be un- insensitive about this, not trying to be overly simplistic about this, but if the Bible teaches it, and it does over and over and over again, Galatians 3.27, Romans 6.4, Mark 16.16, 16, Acts 2.38, on and on we could go. There's no question about what the Bible teaches, including in the words of Jesus himself, as to how important baptism is. Jesus himself needed to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If that is what the Bible says over and over again, and you can't wrap your philosophical uh, thinking around that, maybe you need to just jettison your philosophy. 
It's not about making God's word make sense in my mind. I'm not sure that I could ever adequately explain to you or to myself why it has to be baptism or why it has to be any other aspect of gospel, of gospel teaching that we might want to talk about. That doesn't make any difference. The only thing that matters is whether or not we are willing to allow the Spirit into our heart and to guide everything that we say, everything that we do, everything that we believe. That is the person who is truly being led by the Spirit that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The one who's being led by the Spirit will find the truth. And no matter how strange, no matter how inexplicable that truth happens to be, he will find a way or she will find a way to put it to work in the individual life. Now, maybe you'll be able to understand it a little bit better as you study, as you give your heart more and more over to Jesus Christ. But let's start with this very, very basic concept. God does not have to explain himself to me. This is not a matter of God dumbing himself down to fit inside my feeble little brain. This is about my feeble little brain accepting its limitations and trusting in God to provide a better, holier path for me and believing that going down that path, he will save me. That is the decision that is what faith ultimately is all about. Jonathan Edwards didn't invent that. The Apostle Paul didn't invent that. And I certainly didn't invent that. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe that gospel. It is, in fact, as Romans 1.16 says, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Anyway, that's what I've been reading. This is what I've been hearing. Bad things happen under communist governments. I've always understood that in a general sort of sense. I don't want to get overly political in this space, but... Uh, we are aware that regimes in Cuba and Cambodia and Vietnam and, and other places in the world, Russia certainly, bad things have happened because the political philosophy of the day did not value human life. And certainly that has been the case over the years in China. Back in 1975, I uh, remember John Denver's Windsong album. We played it over and over again in, in my house. I'm sorry for the way things are in China. John Denver would sing. I, I don't know if, if he had anything specific in mind. I certainly didn't have anything specific in mind. But the idea that human beings can be cruel to other human beings when they have an inordinate amount of power, that's not unique to communism. It's certainly not unique to the 20th and 21st century. I don't know specifically what was going on in the 70s, and I have limited knowledge of what's going on now. But there are continued reports, and have been for many years, about what's going on in Chinese prisons, particularly with regard to religious dissidents. Word is that, especially Falun Gong uh, partakers and the uh, Uyghur Muslims are being rounded up and thrown into prison. And then beyond that, they are being killed and having their organs harvested. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, that is an atrocity, obviously. And, and it's not just idle speculation. I, I did some research. I hate seeing these, these sites and just assuming that it's true and then finding out a couple of days ago this was some kind of satire site or grossly overrated or, or questionable research or whatever. This appears to be legitimate. Uh, the NBC News has reported on this. The Guardian has reported on this. Others as well. And not just recently, for years. Back in 2014, the Chinese government went on the record saying we're working on this, which seems to indicate that they knew there was at least the appearance of a problem. And they're saying that it's not a problem anymore. And an independent tribunal, which, take that for what it's worth, is now insisting that that is not the case, that things have not, in fact, gotten better, that people are dying on a regular basis. Thousands of people. It's difficult to figure out exactly how many. And many of them because of their faith, because they took a principled moral religious stand that opposed the concepts that the government stood for and they died for it. Now, I try not to get overly worked up about things that do not concern me directly, things that I cannot change. I'm not going to be able to fix the problems in China. 
no matter how many podcasts I put together, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. I will pray and I will hope for better things, especially for my brethren in those parts of the world. But what if it did concern me? What if I were in a position where it mattered to me directly? What if, for instance, I needed a heart or I needed a kidney or I needed a liver? And I was told that for the right amount of money, if I arrived at the right hospital at the right time, I could have what I looked for. I could preserve my life. And the fewer questions I asked about the origin of this organ, the better. Would I be willing to make that kind of a deal? I am currently in possession of all of my original equipment. It's 52 plus years old, but most of it is more or less in working order, at least appears to be. So I don't have to worry about that kind of thing. A lot of other people do, though, including some people who are near and dear to me. And as far as I know, none of them are flying to China for an organ transplant. And, and I would approve of that choice. Not everybody would. Uh, the, uh, the story of Faust came to mind when I was thinking about this segment here. Uh, Faust, of course, is the old story about the man who sold his soul for gain in this life. It reminded me of Matthew chapter 5 and verse number uh, number 20. 28. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than the whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of the body than for your whole body to go into hell. That may be a little bit on the nose. Uh, apologies for uh, any hurt feelings out there. Uh, and obviously Jesus is not talking about any kind of black market organ trafficking process going on here. But he is saying that there is a cost for your soul. And if you are willing to do what it takes to be on the side of right, you can be pleasing to God. Or you can hold on to something that is, in your mind anyway, vital. Hold on to life itself. And in so doing, lose your soul over it. I, I hope and pray that I would have the, the moral center to avoid making the wrong choice under those circumstances. I, I don't think, as a 21st century American, I'm ever going to be called upon to sacrifice a body part so that I could stay in good graces with God. But it does make me question how committed I am, am I really to this task? Do I love the Lord enough to give up a body part? Do I love the Lord enough to stay true to his calling, even if it means a substantial and even a permanent sacrifice of physical things in this life. We say all the time that our treasure is laid up in heaven. We are not storing up treasures on the earth, but then when the treasures on the earth are threatened, all of a sudden the rules go out the window. It's really easy to serve Jesus Christ when it doesn't cost us anything. There's going to come a time, sorry for the spoiler alert here, there's going to come a time when your faith will cost you something. And you get to decide on that day how committed you are to this task. Do you really live for the Lord? Do you really live for heaven? Or when it comes down to it, are you trying to make as comfortable an existence in this life as possible? And as long an existence in this life as possible. The saints in the churches of Asia that Jesus writes to in Revelation dealt with this all the time. Exactly how much death and dismemberment was going on there is a little bit questionable. At least one man had died, though. In Pergma, Manipus had died. And certainly people were suffering. People were struggling because of their faith. And Jesus' message to them was not give X amount and then you can quit giving. Then it's going to be okay to compromise. His answer was, yes, it's bad and it's going to get worse. Stay the course. Remain faithful. Be true to your calling. Overcome the world. And receive the blessing that Jesus has waiting for you after this life is over. That is not an easy thing for us to do always. And perhaps being in 21st century America, it's become so easy to live undisturbed, unchallenged lives that when the occasional stumbling block does come, it seems like a mountain. I'm not rooting for bad times. I'm not rooting for communist China to, to come in and take over things here and set up new rules and such. But I am saying this, that whatever regime we're serving under, whatever our government, whatever our system 
we need to be prepared to put God's things first and not make compromises that serve our short-term interests in the flesh or even our long-term interests in the flesh. The only interest that we have in mind is Jesus and our home with him in heaven. We cannot afford to threaten that because of some kind of carnal consideration, however critical it may seem in the short term. Life is three score and ten. Heaven is eternity. Let's not get confused. Anyway, that's what I've been hearing. If you want to stop listening at this point and go your way, I hope you've found the message instructive, inspiring, and most of all, faithful to God's Word. Please don't forget to like, rate, share, subscribe, and follow. But if you stick around for a few more minutes, I would like to share with you a way to amuse yourself in a wholesome manner while waiting here in Satan's world, and perhaps pick up a spiritual point or two in the process. This is what I've been playing. Dystopic realities are basically, by their nature, depressing and sad. Uh, maybe it's an environmental disaster. Maybe it is an economic collapse. Uh, more often than not these days, it's a political regime from the right side of the aisle that's taken over and basically robbed everybody of their rights. At any rate, you wind up with this society where nobody has any rights. Everybody's unhappy and kind of toiling away for the, the bosses on high. Everybody is very, very sad and depressed. and It's, it's an ugly reality. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you play Euphoria, you can build a better dystopia. It says so right on the box. Build a better dystopia. And apparently the way that you do that is by being in charge, which is a neat little trick if you can manage to pull that off. You can set up your own dystopia where you can control your workers, which are represented by dice, and those workers go out and accomplish things in your culture. They may go to permanent places like the incinerator of historical accuracy or the arc of fractured memories. Or they can go to any number of markets that may change from game to game and uh, accomplish things there, like places like the Registry of Personal Secrets or the Cafeteria of Nameless Meat or one of my favorites, the Friendly Local Game Bonfire. And what you do is you get the most out of your workers and build up as good a society as you possibly can. And, and in a nutshell, you do this by maximizing their happiness and minimizing their intelligence. It's a rather cynical way of, of looking at the world, granted, and hopefully done in good humor. Maybe not for everybody, but if, you, if you're if you amused by that sort of thing, you can have a lot of fun with, with euphoria. We're not encouraging this sort of political upheaval, obviously, here at, at uh, Citizen of Heaven. We oppose this sort of thing in general terms. But in terms of having fun, this might be your thing. I, we enjoy euphoria a great deal. But it does bring up questions with regard to leadership and what your role is. Is your role to serve the masses? Is your role to help other people? Or is your role simply to create stability? Which is a fancy way of saying helping yourself. And this is a critical question with regard to leadership in, in real world scenarios. And of course, I, I would rather focus toward the scenarios in the local church with regard to this sort of thing. Because there are different philosophies of leadership with regard to local churches as well. The New Testament organizes Christians into bodies of saints, local bodies of saints. First Timothy chapter 3 particularly talks about how elders and deacons are set up in those local churches. And that individual local congregation operates autonomously and functions according to the will of Jesus Christ as being the head shepherd, of course, after uh, and, and the elders or shepherds of the church directing the affairs under his general oversight as well. And there are a couple of ways that you can do that in a way that would maximize your peace, your short-term peace as a leader. And uh, two of them, quite frankly, are to keep the people happy and to keep the people ignorant. If you can do that, you got a really good chance of remaining in power, as it were. And I, I shudder to think of elders of local churches thinking of themselves as being people in power. That's a very bad attitude to take, but that's the way a lot of elders are. Maybe you've seen people operate like this. And one of the ways that they stay in power is by keeping the people happy. That is to say, give them whatever they want. If they want entertainment, give them entertainment. If they want food, give them food. You know, it's, it's not all that difficult. They're just writing checks out of the church treasury. They're not actually paying anything for this. It's the church that's paying for these kind of things. It's government handouts, basically, on a local church level. So if keeping the people happy is the ob objective, you can do that. Or keeping them ignorant 
if they are in trouble, if there is some kind of dissension in the midst, if there is false teaching going on, if there's evil practices going on, just throw it under the rug. Do not talk about this kind of thing. If they can, we can just kind of slide by here and not discuss controversial issues and not discuss sin, not even mention sin if we can manage it. We can just convince everybody that they're perfectly okay where they are. They don't have to change. They don't have to improve. They don't have to grow at all. There can be a very real sense of stability in that situation. And it may look in the short term like a good thing, especially if you're one of the elders, because you get to stay in power that way and everything just kind of rocks along like normal. That's not leadership, though. That's not godly leadership. That's just minding the store, as it were. That's taking care of yourself. Godly leadership needs to do better than that. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1 and following, this is Paul's charge to Timothy, the young preacher, who was in charge, just a chapter uh, in the previous letter, of making sure that elders and deacons were properly set up in the local church. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of the of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away from their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfilled your ministry. This is your job, Paul tells Timothy. Your job is to be a minister. Your job is to be a servant, a worker, uh, one who promotes God's will, the will of Jesus Christ. That may or may not make people happy. I, I love the, the idea of wanting to have their ears tickled. That's the way a lot of people are. I could preach a, a year's worth of sermons and never get myself in trouble if I never said anything. That's not my job, though. That's not the preacher's job. It's not our job to make things calm. Our job is to promote the glory of Jesus Christ in individual members and in the church as at large. The, there's a difference between our peace and God's peace. Philippians, or sorry, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 talks about how we're supposed to pursue the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's God's kind of peace. God's kind of peace is when we are unified in the spirit, which is to say the teachings of the Holy Spirit. When we're all doing what God wants us to do, when we're all following in the pattern of Jesus Christ, then we can have God's peace. And that's the only peace that matters. What difference does it make if we believe ourselves to be at peace when, in fact, we are not only at war, but we're at war against God? We can't have that. We have to do better than that. And it's up to spiritual leadership to make sure we do better than that. It's not enough to simply mine the store and make sure nothing burns down. Now, we appreciate it if nothing burns down. But... If war is necessary, and sometimes factions are necessary, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If some people are not standing for the truth, somebody's going to have to stand up and oppose them. When Diotrephes raises his head, somebody who is more godly than that is going to have to stand up and oppose him. That's not an easy thing to do. It's not a convenient thing to do. In the short term, it's not a peaceful thing to do. But if we want to build a better body of Christ, if we want to build according to Jesus' pattern, on Jesus' foundation, we have to do what Jesus has told us to do. Whether we're talking about leaders, we're talking about followers, we're talking about all of the above. If we can pursue God's will in God's way, if we can allow the Spirit to guide us in all things, we can have His reality for our life instead of some conjured up reality that makes us feel good or makes certain individuals among us feel good. That's not good enough for the body of Christ. We have to do better than that. We have to create a society that will glorify Him and not just serve the interests of a special few. Anyway, that's what I've been playing. Thank you for listening to the Citizen of Heaven podcast. If you profited from your time here, I have a few requests of you. Please pray for me and for this work. We need more Citizens of Heaven, and our prayer is that we be part of achieving this objective. Please subscribe to this podcast, and give a good rating on iTunes and other sites that allow you to do such things, and spread the word to your friends. Please follow my work through my website, www.halhammonds.com. There you'll find links to articles, videos, and books of mine. Seek me out on social media. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and especially Facebook. Look for me and for my pages, The Final Word, The Preacher, 20 Pages a Week, and Citizen of Heaven. Until next time, 
be strong and courageous, fight the good fight of faith, and do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Hal Hammonds, the Citizen of Heaven, signing off.